Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on this beautiful Tuesday, March 29th of 2016 to engage with our esteemed presenters as part of the Guidelines International Network webinar series. My name is Tom Getches. I'm Director of Clinical Practice at the American Academy of Neurology in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the incoming chair of the Guidelines International Network North American chapter. I'll be moderating today's session. Our three speakers will share their viewpoints and perspectives on the Choosing Wisely campaign, including the success and challenges of the campaign, the consumer perspective in their involvement, and the approach some societies have taken in developing their lists. Each presenter will take approximately 10 to 15 minutes to deliver their content, and after each speaker, we will have approximately five minutes to answer your questions you may have for that particular speaker. As a reminder, you're set to listen only mode, so your only opportunity to ask questions is through the chat feature located on the computer screen. Before I pass the baton to Daniel Wolfson, I'd like to have you take a moment and select the response on the screen that you most identify with. This will give us a sense of the perspectives that we have attending this session. While you're submitting your responses, please allow me to briefly introduce Daniel Wolfson. He is the Executive Vice President and COO of the ABIM Foundation. Mr. Wolfson has been instrumental in leading the Choosing Wisely campaign, a multi-year effort engaging more than 70 medical specialty societies. Daniel received his master's degree in Health Services Administration from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Prior to graduate school, Mr. Wolfson worked in the Social Services Department of Massachusetts General Hospital. I'm going to close this poll and display the results. So we can see here that about two-thirds of our attendees are guideline developers and about an equal third consumers. A small percentage are physicians or healthcare providers, and uh, about 16, 17 percent identify as others. So, uh, Daniel, I'm going to pass the baton to you, and you have the floor. Go ahead. Thank you very much for having me today, Tom, and um, welcome to all the participants. Um, happy to talk about the Choosing Wisely campaign that's been going on since 2012. And just looking to advance the slide. There we go. I'm going to uh, cover a lot of ground um, in a short period of time, so we have lots of time for questions. Uh, but let me just define what I think Choosing Wisely is. Um, Choosing Wisely is a campaign that has worked with over 70 specialty societies, both physician and non-physician groups, to identify at least five tests and procedures that are wasteful, that is, benefits do not exceed risks. This is a physician-led effort. This, we consider this professionalism in action, physician groups taking leadership to re self-regulate itself. These are evidence-based guidelines. They are not clinical guidelines, and we can discuss that in further detail. We will discuss, and Dominic Caruso will discuss, our partnership with consumer reports and partners. So this is a physician and consumer-led campaign. This campaign is an awareness, an attitudinal change strategy. It is not by itself an implementation strategy. It is about starting conversations that are rational about overuse without the hysterias of people talking about rationing or death panels. Um, something that was going on when we started the campaign. It does provide a platform to have rational conversations about overuse between the profession and the patient and describing each responsibility. The spread of choosing wisely has been remarkable. I'm sitting in Toronto, Canada, about to uh, speak at a choosing wisely national conference, um, and we can talk about um, its appeal internationally, but nationally is what we are focused on. Um, so you see our, our uh, purpose 
engage in these conversations and to support both the patient and physician in these conversations. The whole campaign is based on professionalism, uh, based on the physician charter that was produced in 2002, which talks about social justice, which is directly related to the stewardship of resources and physicians' responsibility to be good stewards of resources. And that was what we were trying to change. We were trying to change views of um, physicians about their role in controlling healthcare costs when only 36% said it was their responsibility to be controlling costs. Um, and in fact, I understand that you know if you look now at another number that we collected when we asked them, are you responsible for utilization, um, more of them will talk about that as being their responsibility. And so 58% of physicians say that they're in the best position to address the problem of overuse meaning utilization only, uh, with government as a distant second, 15%. But that is not a very good number. That's 42% that say that they're not in the best position to address the problem. And that's what we were out to change. So what we've learned so far about uh, the campaign, and I'll go over these things um, uh, quickly, um, is that there's power in professionalism. Um, and that uh, leadership and partnership are really important. How you talk about overuse and communication, the language you use is important. That culture uh, is important. Changing mindsets is um, imperative. If you want behavioral change, we often go uh, to system changes without mindset changes, without attitude changes, without people really buying in. Uh, we go to technical um, change before we go to adoptive change. Um, the power of responsibility and ownership of the clinicians and, and patients in this campaign, uh, open platform and, and choosing wisely in system changes that have been going on. Um, so I'm going to go quite quickly, but this is the 70 um, specialty societies. And what it represents is not only their participation, but think of them as uh, the ability to spread uh, messages around overuse. Think about them as distribution centers uh, to get information out to a wide swath of physicians and giving the message that it is their responsibility to think about overuse and the message of it's a physician professional obligation to do so. Uh, here's our partnerships uh, with grantees with through Robert Wood Johnson uh, trying to get um, this concentrated at the local community. Um, power communications, I'm going through this quickly, but I, I think uh, I'd, I'd love to have more discussion. Uh, but changing conversations from uh, more is better to less is sometimes better was one of our particular goals. The framing of the issue was quite important. We spent a lot of time before we started the campaign about what language to use. Language is important. And I can't uh, overemphasize uh, simplicity of the campaign. Um, the notion of producing five uh, very um, succinct don'ts uh, has power to it. And, um, and I won't go through all these other ones, but being concrete, being having credibility to specialty societies uh, was all important to this campaign. And of course, the timing uh, was important too. We're going from, uh, um, uh, you know, um, messages about value now, so away from value, and, and that was important. Um, we learned a lot uh, from patient safety culture. Um, and as I said before, we're uh, often uh, quick to go to quality improvement uh, without cl uh, clinician engagement. So we're hoping that. Um, the involvement of the physicians in the beginning, uh, taking ownership or responsibility, will transfer into better implementation of the choosing wisely recommendations. But emphasize again that um, education is the lowest form of quality improvement there is. Um, you need, um, you know, system changes, uh, data and feedback, and so on. Um, these are the responsibilities and ownerships and creating lists. We gave them. 
ownership of that, but we gave them guidelines uh, saying that it had to be specialty control, frequently used, uh, transparent process, and evidence-based. Um, they used their own uh, um, processes uh, using uh, what was uh, culturally uh, innate to them, uh, how they went about uh, uh, doing their work, uh, usually using existing uh, structures uh, that they had for quality and safety. Uh, this is what the Choosing Wisely um, um, recommendations look like on the left. It states what not to do, and then underneath gives uh, qualifying red flags uh, to do. Um, somebody just asked, what do the colors mean? Uh, I can't tell you what the colors mean, but they were designed by a PR company and have no uh, inherent meaning except they look nice. Um, on the right, um, that is the uh, Choosing Wisely um, Consumer Report uh, conversion of those recommendations in easy to read, consumer uh, centric uh, format. Um, and Dominic will talk more about that. Um, and we have lots of institutions now implementing this, but uh, Choosing Wisely by itself is, is uh, not an implementation strategy we would have designed the campaign in a much different way. But organizations are doing what they do around quality improvement, system changes, hardwiring, EMRs, and so on. And we're, getting, we're beginning to get uh, good information from, from sites. We just, uh, uh, there was a, a paper recently from the University of Utah that used a multitude of interventions, um, including uh, financial incentives, education, uh, hard wiring EMRs and got uh, lab costs down, cost per day down, cost per visits down, um, and we're continuing to track that and encourage that. Uh, what we need to do now, um, uh, there needs to be better ownership and professionalism going forward uh, uh, with both the designs of lists, more challenging lists, um, and uh, them taking leadership in, in implementation. Uh, development of measures for QI is an issue. Uh, we could talk about that as well. Uh, continue to wrap up uh, recommendations. I've already said that. You can read the rest. So for more information, uh, please go to our site, choosingwisely.org. There's all the recommendations by all the sites by all the specialty societies, as well as resources, including a newsletter that does track implementation. Um, and um, please follow us on um, ABIM Foundation and Wolfson D. Um, so uh, that's kind of it. Um, also on the resource uh, page, uh, we have a, a, a tape of uh, communication approaches uh, to, for physicians to talk to their patients about unnecessary care. So I'll uh, pass this over back to you, Tom, and um, thank you very much for your, for your time. Well, Daniel, thanks very much for giving us that overview of the, of the campaign. There are a couple questions that are coming in. A reminder, if you'd like to submit a question, please do that through the chat. I'll be watching these, uh, flagging them, and then putting uh, and, then, and then posing these to our speakers. Uh, one of the questions, Daniel, you talked about the colors, but I'm going to go back on your slides because I think that question was in reference to slide nine, which I put back up on the screen. Is there any rhyme or reason for the colors other than they're very nicely done? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, no, that's a you. very good question. Thank you for answering that. Uh, those are the three waves of participation in the Choosing Wisely campaign. So um, we have the, I call them the Courageous Nine. Uh, they were the first ones to come out um, in 2012. And, uh, and then a second wave of 17 came out, and they're in blue. And then the rest are, I believe that's a purple, um, uh, participated um, in uh, the Choosing Wisely campaign after that. And uh, uh, we don't uh, uh, penalize people from coming in late. 
but uh, I think we've got um, most um, uh, institutions, uh, specialty societies in, although we're talking to more and we're talking to a pharmacy organization, and um, we have people that are doing multiple lists. Um, they just don't do five. Um, family practice has done 15. Um, so um, that that's always welcomed. Um, and then we uh, hoping uh, the American Dental Association will be coming in as well. So um, uh, you know we we actually produced 17 lists this year alone. That was new participants and people uh, developing new lists. So. The list development continues, and just to anticipate a question uh, about wall hanging fruit, um, I think that um, I've heard that many times. Um, some I think are very challenging and are not wall hanging fruit. Um, uh, surgical ones tended to be wall hanging fruit, uh, I think, because mostly they didn't have good evidence in the surgical areas. But I think it was not wall hanging fruit for the Society of General Medicine to come out and say that um, uh, physicals uh, for uh, non-symptomatic patients, routine physicals, was not necessary. I didn't think it was low-hanging fruit when the radiation oncologist said don't do proton beam therapy uh, for prostate cancer. Um, I didn't think it was low-hanging fruit when oncology came out and talked about um, not treating uh, uh, patients in the uh, uh, last stages of life. So I think there are very challenging uh, recommendations, and to characterize them as all well-hanging fruit I don't think is correct. Uh, there are some, I totally admit. Uh, but I would say the vast majority are good. Uh, we have lots of imaging recommendations, and um, I think if we could implement a quarter of the 400 we would make making a major impact on uh, healthcare quality and safety. I, I also think that I think we overestimate what we thought was the purpose of those recommendations. There were something concrete to begin a conversation. 400 can't possibly address all of what is unnecessary tests and procedures under under certain circumstances, and it was just the beginning to have a concrete thing to begin the conversation. We hope the conversation is happening over many more than 400 recommendations and is perva per, you know, um, pervasive in people's thinking about more is not always better. That's what we were trying to get at. Mm -hmm. You know, another question that's come in, are there societies that have, is there a mechanism for societies to submit less than five? recommendations or is the minimum five? We actually ask them to come in with five. Okay. And they, they, and they could come in with more and they did, but uh, there was something about five that we thought was um, simple to remember. And okay. again, we, we went after, you know, simplicity and uh, we think that was important. We had a question from an audience member asking about uh, payers implementing these in payment programs. Are you aware of this of, of this happening? And if so, what is ABIM Foundation's stance? Our, our position from the beginning, uh, and we talked to payers, was uh, we thought that if they begin to make a benefit, uh, design benefits based on these recommendations, the campaign would fall apart. Um, that 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 was the intentions of the of, of the recommendations. They're too clinically nuanced to be doing that. Uh, there's red flags that uh, you know are a part of the recommendations. And I think for the most part, and I'd be very interested in if there's cases where there have been benefit determinations based on choosing wisely, because we'd like to talk to them. Um, but we have had good cooperation uh, with some of the major insurers. And they've seen um, themselves as being educators, particularly in the consumer side, that more is not always better. Um, mm -hmm. So I think so far so good, and we're always on the lookout uh, to see if there are people using them in ways that we think are not productive to this conversation. 
So I'll ask one more question. We're coming up on that five minutes, and, and this is in the queue about the standards uh, for evidence uh, for these recommendations. Can you talk a little bit about the required or the recommended methodologies for these societies to submit and support their, their five? We, um, we gave them uh, um, these, five, these four uh, what I call a guidepost. And after that, they, they were allowed to vary their methodology. Um, that gave them the comfort of abiding by what they thought was the best methodology and the best culture. We did benchmark a lot of the methodologies used and began to use best practices and talk about best practices to influence how people went about doing their um, recommendations. But I, I think Deborah will talk about this. They're not intended to be clinical guidelines. They're intended to, they're intended to be uh, off of clinical guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that one of the uh, um, offshoots of choosing wisely will be that clinical guidelines will, in fact, have things what not to do. Clinical guidelines often have what to do but not always about what not to you know not to do, and I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And um, th this was a, this was very challenging to specialty societies. They're, they've been involved in clinical guidelines for a long time, but not focused on what not to do, and that was a, that was a challenge. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks to our participants for submitting those questions, and Daniel, thank you again for education on the. Kind of campaign and right I'd love to I'd love to answer some more questions because there was some great questions and maybe we'll have time for those. Great. I'm gonna move on to our next presenter, Dominic. I'm gonna advance here to your first slide and introduce you. So Dominic LaRusso is the director of health partnerships and leads several health impact campaigns, including Choosing Wisely at Consumer Reports. In this role, Dominic works with national and regional partner groups in developing methods to reach each of their members and constituents. Dominic has over 25 years of professional experience with expertise in IT, project management, and partner engagement. So, Dom, I'll pass the baton to you to take it away. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tom. And I'll, uh, again, I appreciate you giving me the time to speak here, and I look forward to talking through this. So, first, let me just start off with what our role is at Consumer Reports, and I think Daniel alluded to it. But we're a partner in this Using Wisely campaign, and what that really means is that we support the, since the medical societies and the other partners and constituents in the campaign, and we create patient-friendly materials based on the society recommendations. So what we do is we take the recommendations, um, we interview the medical societies and the specialists there, <clears throat> excuse me, we then take these recommendations and we create patient-friendly material, and I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. We use a health literacy organization to help us translate the resources into plain language, and we end up disseminating through our partner network, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in a second. So we have over, engaged over 50 national and regional organizations, um, all who partner us with us to reach over 100 million consumers. That, that's what we estimate that we've reached. Um, the way we do this is we reach out to the organizations and we work with them to reach their members. So some samples of these include business groups, such as the National Business Group on Health, the Pacific Business Group on Health. We have national media partners, such as AARP, Wikipedia. Um, if you go onto Wikipedia and you search back pain and you find a back pain article, somewhere in that back pain article there will be references to the Choosing Wisely campaign and the Choosing Wisely recommendations. Uh, we've worked with union groups, um, public health and community organizations, such as the LA County Department of Public Health has been very active. Uh, we have a large network of regional health collaboratives, um, Healthcare Collaborative of Greater Columbus and Maine Quality Counts are two of our, I guess you want to call them stars, but they've, they've done so much outreach to employers and to provider groups in, in their network. Um, consumer groups, the National Partnership for Women and Families, uh, the National Center for Farm Worker Health, medical societies, a couple of medical societies have partnered with us to disseminate our resources in addition to actually creating the resources. And then healthcare software vendors and cost transparency vendors such as Cast Life Health, um, iTriage, HealthSpark, and organizations like that. I do want to just um, go back and comment for a second. 
uh, Daniel had mentioned about the, the the number of organizations and how they've come in waves in the, in the medical societies. And um, just as a as a tribute to the campaign, what Consumer Reports does with each of the medical societies is we sign content agreements because we're co-branding their resources. Um, we're working with them to distribute the resources. And you know, the first I will tell you, the first nine was extremely painful. It would take a couple of weeks sometimes to get through the contract negotiations, sometimes even longer. The second wave was a lot easier, and I will tell you now, as societies join the campaign, they're actually reaching out to me, and in some cases, we've signed these agreements in, in less than a day or, you know, in a couple of days. So it's been, it's been amazing to watch it, and, and the momentum of the campaign just grows. So I just want to touch quickly on some of the resources that we've created for this campaign. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've, had, we've created posters, um, videos, and TV, radio, public service announcements. We have wallet cards. You see it on the bottom of that page, a Choosing Wisely wallet card that we've disseminated to you know, hundreds and thousands of, of these to, to various groups. We've created um, e-hubs, meaning basically what that means is they're, they're content hubs, a uh, place where you can go to find all of the antibiotic recommendations and, and tools available from Choosing Wisely. Uh, one of our most famous, famous one of our favorite features or, or our partner's favorite features are what we call microsites. These are co-branded sites that we, we create and manage for organizations um, that are, are partnering with us. So they can create a site, we can create a site for them, they'll have their logo and they'll have their subset or their information, their subset of choosing wisely recommendations on those page pages. All are available in plain English and Spanish. Some can be co-branded. If you look in the middle of the page there, there's a five questions to ask your doctor poster. We've co-branded that for many organizations where you can put their logo in there. And everything we do here is free, free to use, free to distribute. There is no charge for anything. Um, this is, this is a, um, a, you know, an advocacy kind of effort here, an impact effort where we're trying to get, our, get the word out. On our next slide, as I mentioned before, the, these, are, these are the typical Choosing Wisely brochure that you see in front of you here. We've done a, about 100 of these. We've covered about 100 of the 450 topics. Every single one of them the Specialty Society endorsed, as you can see. It's got their logo on it as well as the Choosing Wisely logo, Consumer Reports, and ABIM. The idea here is to support conversations. So they're always here not giving direction or not giving a recommendation but really to just kind of guide the conversation, to have a patient sit up and say, you know what, do I really need that test? Say, doctor, um, you know, this, this, the American Academy of Family Physicians is saying that that MRI may not be necessary. What do you think? So it's, it, that's the intention of them. Um, if you look at this brochure, this is a sample, a typical brochure. That's the back and front. The, usually the white copy, what you see in white there, is generated from the conversations or the interviews we've had with the medical societies, the physicians. The blue copy is always what Consumer Reports recommends. So much of what a Choosing Wisely piece is what not to do, you know, or what, you know, you shouldn't have that imaging test or you shouldn't get that antibiotic. What Consumer Reports then is does offer alternatives, meaning, um, you know, for your back pain, have heat or ice or, and I can't read that right now, but, so I'm not sure exactly what it says. But Consumer Reports provides the, the alternate advice. What I want to show you here is just how our, um, how our material has evolved. It, it, it began as those two page reports that you've seen. And what we've committed to do with um, the ABIM Foundation and all the medical societies is that for every society that joins, we'll cover at least, at least one of their topics. Um, many societies, we've done more than one topic. American Academy of Family Physicians, I think we've done 13 of the 15 topics. And a lot of the reason is, is that our medical directors and our medical advisors look at the recommendations and they say, oh, this is a good one. This one is going to apply to a lot of consumers and a lot of patients. Some of them are a little more inside baseball and they're hard to translate into a two-page piece. But I just wanted to point out a couple of co-branded things here that we've done. The first is the Spanish one. We've, we've, again, I mentioned that we translated them all into Spanish. In the middle of the page, there's a poster there that says five ways to be smart about ovarian cancer. The Society of Gynecological Oncology asked us to create that resource, and we co-branded it with them. On the right of the, the screen there, you're seeing um, can antibiotics help you feel better. This is a, a secondary translation of a recommendation from the Infectious Disease Society. What we did is we took their, po their two-page two report, which was written at an eighth or ninth grade reading level, and we took it down even a little bit further. Uh, this one is estimated at a fifth or sixth grade reading level. So we're trying to bring to do some reports in a lower literacy level to, to reach a broader audience. This poster here in the middle, it says, do I need this ca cancer test or treatment? 
one of our partners um, is uh, is an organization, and they have clinics, uh, oncology clinics, scattered throughout their network. They felt really important. They felt it really important to have this type of material available in their exam rooms, in their waiting rooms. So we created this poster, and then what they did is they took all the recommendations from ASCO and put them in a booklet and put them on the waiting room and exam rooms, offices, and in, in, in the racks and on tables and things like that to distribute. And then on the right, this is tests and treatments for pro prostate cancer. What this is is, is really a roundup. It's uh, there are multiple topics about prostate cancer and choosing wisely, not by one society. What we've done is create resources like this that, that put them up and combine them into one topic, one document, I should say. On this page, this is just an example of how we've covered specific topics. So this is one topic. It's uh, imaging tests for low back pain. And again, again, I talked about that before. But this is from the American Academy of Family Physicians. What we've done in order to reach broad audiences is that we've changed the photos. So if you see, there are three different samples of the picture there, all with three different photographs of, um, of different ethnicities or different demographics. Again, we created a Spanish one. Additionally, we created on the right there what we call a rack card. It's a very simple to read card. It's got a back and a front. It summarizes the, the recommendation even further. And then we've also created videos. There's one in the middle there that's um, more of a viral video. It's, it's uh, handheld by a, a, um, an iPhone and taken in a, in a gym where she's talking about back pain. And then on the right there, that's a, actually a physician talking about the imaging of back pain and why, why you shouldn't get it or why it's not necessary or what questions you should ask about it. On the next page, what I wanted to just cover here is how do we reach consumers and patients? Obviously, as I said, we reach them through our partner network, but the way that they do it or the way that and we also help them do it is through various, various channels. So we've done it through social media. Um, we have a very active Twitter feed from Consumer Reports, and they often tweet out the recommendations or some of the, the advice that's come from the physicians and the society. And we also have other Twitter feeds, Twitter handles that we use uh, that are more focused. I have one that I tweet out mostly to partners. We have another open, a gentleman in my group that tweets out mostly to consumers. Um, also on the web, we have um, consumer reports will quite often um, ho post stories about choosing wisely as well. And we also have a website called consum consumerhealthchoices.org, which has all of our resources on it. Um, excuse me, EMR systems. There are several EMRs and some, some several physician groups that have actually integrated choosing wisely recommendations as well as the consumer reports patient material directly into their EMR system. On the employer side, we've created a tool set working with IBM uh, called Making Healthy Choices that is, is wrapped around choosing wisely. And what they, that did, they launched that and initiated and kicked it off to all of their employees uh, throughout the United States. And then we took that and we customized it a little bit and we rolled it out to other employers. And we've had several large employers that have uh, cop copied and replicated what IBM did and launched it into their own environment. And then your provider's offices. Um, you know, it, it almost depends on where you are in the country as to whether or not you'll find a choosing wisely piece. And, and again, our goal is to try to get it everywhere. But if you, if you go to Maine, and, and I think these two pictures, photos here are, are directly from a physician's office in Maine. But if you go to Maine, many physician practices have choosing wisely resources hanging on their wall or, or located in racks. Um, we started to make ground in, in many other states. In New York, um, where we where I, my arm office is, there's a couple of organizations or medical practices, large medical practices that we're working with that have done the same kind of thing. So, Dom, I want to interrupt you just for a second. There is a question that came in about uh, obtaining some of this material, what's the best way to do that? The question in the queue is uh, for ovarian cancer awareness. Yes. I assume that there are recommendations from, from choosing wisely about this. How how do they, how can they obtain this? What's the kind of permission um, they need to have? Yeah. Everything we have is um, available for free on consumerhealthchoices.org. Um, there is a tab that's choosing wisely. You could click through that and search for the resources and find the material. It's free. You could download it. Um, you could print it. You could link to it from your website. Um, again, all of the resources are free. So what I wanted to talk about here is just 
a, a, a choosing wisely messaging study that we did back in 2014, and, and I'll go pretty quickly through this. Um, in 2014, our, our survey team conducted a study of 3,000 adults, 2009 random adults, to, to, to help us develop our communication campaign. The intention here wasn't to ask people have they heard of choosing wisely because that, that's not how we approach this. But what we did approach was what are the topics that are most concerned. As we were not surprised, uh, inappropriate use of antibiotics and unnecessary medical care were our top, our top issues. Other things that were less concerning were unnecessary colonoscopy, pap tests, and PSA tests. I'm going to skip through the demographics, but the important thing here is, is an audience engagement. The, the concept of having material available on issues that people are really concerned about are obviously the best way to approach this. If you're less concerned, it's going to take a little bit more and face more resistance. Additionally, again, the summary here, one of the most important findings that we came here, in, and again, probably not really a surprise, is that improved communication between you and your doctors leads to better clinical outcomes. So, I, I mean, this is all about the conversation. It's not a one-way street. It really is intended to be like that. And the second point there, when you actively participate in your health care, you make better health care decisions. So I'll just, uh, as my last slide here, i just talk about what's next. We're shifting our focus to medical practices, and, and when I say that, I'm not avoiding consumers, but what we're trying to do is reach patients at the point of care with our resources. So we are partnering with several pilot practices, developing tools and techniques to help them promote choosing wisely um, and educate the patients at the point of care. Uh, we are increasing our social media efforts. We're developing a crowdsourcing initiative that focuses on the five questions to ask your doctors. We're trying to get patients engaged in that. We've offered free wallet cards to organizations that they can hand out, which includes the five questions. We're really looking for patient champions that are willing to ask the questions to their provider and share their story with us. And then for the last point is focused on antibiotic reduction. One of our CR strategic priorities is reduction of overuse of antibiotics with a focus on patient safety. We're in the early stages of the milestones, but we have a five, three, we'll, we'll ultimately have a three to five year timeline to do this and incorporate that. Lastly, this is um, the website, consumerhealthchoices.org. You could follow us on Facebook. We have a video channel. We have about 20 to 30 videos up. Um, some of them range from 30-second cartoon videos, and I, I don't want to make light of it, but they're, they're intended to be engaging in public service announcements. We've had several partners that have run them on public television in their, in their environment. You could follow me on Twitter, and that is my email address. So I think um, that's it. Yeah, thank you very much for that presentation. As you've probably seen on the presenter side, there are a number of questions that are coming in, but being the moderator, I'm going to take the chair prerogative and talk a little bit. I'm going to move back one slide. You talk about increasing social media efforts and crowdsourcing. There's a big website you may have heard of called Patients Like Me. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Um, when you're looking for ambassadors or champions, has there been um, uh, an effort to try and harmonize or collaborate with, um, you know, leading individuals on that site to engage in this campaign? Uh, yes, we've had some early conversations with, with folks like that. We also have Consumer Reports has their own patient safe patient project, and there's a patient network there. So that is certainly areas that we're looking at. Um, again, we're early in this, so we're trying to drive this as kind of a viral thing for Consumer Reports. Uh, however, we are, do intend to branch it out a little bit further. Hmm. I'm also going to jump back. Uh, this, these are a couple questions. As soon as you mentioned EMR, I could have told you there would have been questions, and there are two in the queue. Um, a little bit about uh, alert fatigue, um, mm -hmm. feedback, um, and then if vendors, do you happen to know which vendors are incorporating statements, and if so, if any of those types of modules or any of that work is, is rolled out to other practices that use that vendor? I'm thinking of Epic. Yeah. Um, do you know if that's taking place? Um, let me just talk about, I'll, I'll take your last part first, is what sure. vendors are, are, have any vendors created modules? Um, the answer to that is no. We have been in conversations with EPIC and have worked with EPIC about developing some kind of common module for it, but that hasn't gone very far yet. We're working with a couple of organizations or medical systems that are using EPIC to hopefully pilot something like that, but it's a slow, um, it's slow to get off the ground. 
um, to answer the, the next question about how is it integrated, um, I couldn't really answer the technical part of that. I do know that it's a lot of work to get it integrated. Mm -hmm. What we've done is work with organizations to try to map uh, specific uh, tests or treatments or recommendations to the Choosing Wisely um, recommendations and then therefore at the same time having a patient piece available. Um, there's been some studies and, and some work on alert fatigue. I, and I, I probably am not best suited to answer that question. I, I know that there's uh, Cedar sinai in California did, and LA did a, a big launch of Choosing Wisely within their medical record system, and they did it on their own, obviously, they're building their own subset of modules. And um, I do know that they felt in the beginning there was a little alert fatigue, but that they got past it because it was um, really driven from the Choosing Wisely recommendations, which, you know, it's not everything. I hope I answered that question. You did satisfactorily for me, so I'm going to say yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> another question that's, that's come in that I'd like uh, your input on is, you know, how uh, is there an opportunity for guideline developers? And as we asked at the beginning, many of the individuals that are attending are representing a medical specialty society and or are guideline developers, many in North America, as our name would suggest. Um, is there an opportunity to piggyback or tap into the, the vast and extensive networks that Consumer Reports has to disseminate not only choosing wisely recommendations like you've done very well, but what about uh, clinical practice guideline recommendations? Um, you know what, we have, I'd have to have um, a little more conversation about what that really meant. Um, sure. You know, our partners have signed on to disseminate Consumer Reports resources. Um, Beyond that is, is, is something that would be a little bit broader and a broader discussion, and, and I'm not trying to, you know, punt the question, but my, my real and my short answer to that is we have only worked with folks to disseminate our resources, consumer reports material. Uh, we don't really see it as a channel to disseminate others. However, if it's, a, if, if it's the kind of material and resources that are patient-friendly, and, and, you know, we can have a conversation more about that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump back to this slide with some of the co-branded resources, and that's, that's to um, queue up another question that's come in about shared decision-making. So these five recommendation statements that come from the societies you have, I've, I'm familiar with the process with the Academy of Neurology having participated in the second wave uh, in developing our, our top five list. Um, these these types of tools and, and this information that you're putting out are really just education about those top five, but is there a move uh, from Consumer Reports to move more towards shared decision making? Um, you know, not right now. I mean, we're, you know, the, the group that I, that I work in, our health impact team, is, is very small. We're just a couple of people. And, um, our efforts are, are really right now around the Choosing Wisely campaign and the recommendations that come out of that. Uh, you know, do I think Consumer Reports will ultimately go there? I, I, I'm just not sure. You know, I think we, you know, we have a, a large spread of resources, you know, across our organization. Our health team is focusing on physician, I'm sorry, hospital ratings and, um, you know, hospital infections, and we're looking at patient safety. Again, shared decision making could come in down the line, but I don't see it right now. Mm -hmm. If I could butt in a little bit, please. Um, you know, I think that what uh, um, Consumer Reports has done is given a tool uh, for a conversation that can be a part of a shared decision making. Mm -hmm. I don't think that Consumer Reports uh, wants to get into the educational aspects of shared decision making, but I think they've presented a tool that can be a part of a larger effort for shared decision making. So um, also on the, on the EMR, uh, I could talk about EMRs as well if you wanted to uh, address some of that as well. Yeah, please. Well, I think that the EMR uh, vendors uh, have uh, on an individual basis uh, implemented uh, and hardwired uh, choosing wisely alerts. Um, and EPIC has done uh, it, not nationally, but with individual. Um, and um, 
the uh, Cedar sinai example is probably the best. They have a company called Stanson uh, that uh, implemented 150 of these. And uh, as Dominic said, there was not a lot of um, pushback. They, they saw uh, about 50% of the alerts being over, uh, uh, overrided by the physician, but there's still 15 to 35% reduction uh, of, of choosing wisely recommendations. Uh, so it's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, I, I think that once you uh, uh, get buy-in, particularly from the specialty societies and physicians see the credibility of that, there tends to be less uh, alert fatigue. And, there, and we certainly got that from you know, Cedar sinai and, and other places as well. We've also had one, one company actually hardwire the choosing wisely um, uh, consumer reports where they're uh, spitting them out, bad word, uh, to the patient uh, at the point of care. Uh, that's uh, hospital and uh, uh, Maryland. Um, so uh, that's happening as well. Deborah, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask if you'd like to provide a comment on this discussion. Anything you'd like to say about EMR use and choosing wisely? I, I think it's it's the it's very difficult to implement that to actually incorporate things like that into an EMR because it's very difficult to sort of identify the right place in the flow of seeing a patient, sort of insert a recommendation, and to make sure that it applies to the right patient. And you have to do it right or else it really pisses people off and creates, you know, beyond alert fatigue. So I think, I think it's actually quite challenging to do that, which is why it hasn't happened at least on a very broad scale. Um, but I think, I think in terms of meaningful use, as, as meaningful use moves forward in EMRs, I do think that that sort of thing will happen. And I think the systems to support it will be worked out. Okay. Well, thank you all for your comments, uh, and Dominic, thank you for your presentation. I'm going to move us along on the next slide into our final presenter. You've just heard from her, but this is Dr. Deborah Korenstein. She's a general internist, a clinician educator, health services researcher, and the director of clinical effectiveness at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Her main research and educational efforts focus on avoiding overuse of medical resources, and other areas of interest include evidence-based medicine, conflicts of interest in medical education, research, and practice. Prior to her role at Sloan Kettering, Dr. Korenstein was editor-in-chief of the ACP Smart Medicine, an evidence-based clinical decision support tool, and the founding director of the primary care residency program at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. So, Deborah, I've given control over to you. Uh, go ahead and proceed. Great. Thank you so much, Tom, and thank you, uh, Jen, for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm going to talk a little bit about my role with Choosing Wisely, and I think I have a bit of a broad perspective because I've been involved in a variety of different ways. I'm also going to talk about the development process and processes for top five lists and my own experience with developing one particular list, which I think offers some insights into some of the challenges of, of this whole thing. Oops, sorry. So I was actually, I've been involved early on in the initiative, and in fact, um, Daniel and I had a conversation probably in 2011 about choosing wisely, because at, at that time I was doing some research in overuse, and so we got to talking about it. I, I performed some stakeholder interviews actually for ABIM Foundation to help define next steps. I've been involved in ACP initiatives, particularly the, the high, different aspects of the high value care initiative. I've also made some videos for consumer reports and actually when Dom showed a still shot from one of the videos, that was me. I was the physician in that still shot, but he didn't know that because we've never actually met in person. So Dom, that was me. And I also was a member of the SGIM Ad Hoc Choosing Wisely Committee. That's the Society of General Internal Medicine. Actually, Daniel alluded when he spoke to one of, the, um, one of our recommendations, which I'm going to speak about in a little bit more detail. So I want to start by talking about the process for the generation of the list. Because it really, as Daniel said, there, was no, there were not really strict guidelines for how to do it. It has really differed across organizations. 
for, for some organizations, it really is not terribly systematic, but usually it's some sort of, sort of quasi-systematic iterative process that people have put in place. It's often, but not always, based on a literature review. It's also sometimes just based on participant recommendations. So the, the organization puts together a committee and they just sort of brainstorm ideas, which I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. There's often nothing, no, nothing to really go by otherwise. But it really isn't standardized. And I think it brings home the point that these are not guidelines. And I'm sure that people on the call today are aware of that, but sometimes I think that gets a little bit lost in the shuffle when people talk about choosing wisely. But they're really not guidelines. So I'm going to give you a couple of example processes and then tell you in more detail about our process at SGIM. So this is a, a sort of map of a process from the Swiss Society of General Internal Medicine. And this was fairly recent. So when, when this group developed their list, they had a lot of older lists to work from. And that's, that's really what they did. So in this case, they started with other organizations' rep uh, recommendations. And then they added their own. You can see the sort of other recommendations here in blue. They added their own recommendations to those. And then they went through sort of four rounds of selection and pruning to come up with their five. And, you know, at least this is transparent. It's hard to know exactly how they did that, but it's, but it's, but it's pretty transparent. So I have a couple of two other examples on this slide. One from the American Urological Association, which this is their description. They established a committee to identify topics. They used a consensus process, and then they had their board review and approve the recommendations. So that's, we don't know too much about that from this description. And the American College of Physicians did something, I think, probably a little bit more robust, where they formed a work group of 11 physicians that they specifically said had evidence assessment skills. They collaboratively identified items. The list was narrowed by ACP staff, but then reviewed by a randomly selected group from their research panel, which is interesting. So I think their, their notion was to sort of get broad member support. You can see that these processes certainly are variable. But the process that I actually took, participated in was with the Society of General Internal Medicine. So what we did is established an ad hoc committee with 10 people from two different established committees in the organization, the Clinical Practice Committee and the Evidence-Based Medicine Committee, which I was a member of. We met and brainstormed topics. We then rated all of the topics on three, in three domains, by strength of evidence, by relevance to general internal medicine, and, and sort of our standing as experts. Because there was, by then there were actually a lot of other recommendations out, and we wanted to make sure that we would be seen as expert enough that what we said would have some weight. Um, and potential impact, both, clinician, both clinical and financial. Our committee then voted on the top five, and then our list was approved by the SGIM Council, which is sort of the leadership organization for the, um, for the society. So this just sort of shows you the same thing that I just said. So you can see on the left that the ad hoc committee was consisted of people from the Clinical Practice Committee and the EBM Task Force, and it was, I believe it was five now, actually, there were three of us from the EBM Task Force and seven people from the Clinical Practice Committee. We met and we generated initially 20 topics. We all went independently, and we rated each one by strength of evidence, relevance, and potential financial and clinical impact. We then uh, met again to narrow the list to 10, and that was based purely on everybody's independently generated rankings. And we then narrowed, narrowed it to 10 and then voted to determine out of those 10, the top five. And then we split up into pairs to actually write the discussions that would accompany each recommendation. And then our final list was, as I said, approved by the SGIM Council. So on the next slide, you can see our list. And it looks just like the other list that, that Daniel showed. So I'm going to focus on the second recommendation, which was highly controversial within the organization. I think that there are some lessons to be learned from this controversy, which is why I'm going to go into it in more detail. So the recommendation is don't perform routine general health checks for asymptomatic adults. So we were praised for this recommendation, in, in particular for this one, since we were one of the only organizations, if not the only one, to make a recommendation that threatened our own financial bottom line because 
the Society of General Internal Medicine is general internists who really make their money by doing a lot of routine checks. And so we were praised. So this article in the New England Journal, you can see in the, in the parts that I've sort of boxed out, kind of praised us for this. And this recommendation was actually featured in, in consumer, some consumer reports material that was developed. So everybody was loving us except for our own members who were very much not loving us. So there was really an outcry from many members of SGIM. And I mean, this evolved over a, over a couple of months time, and I'm not gonna go into all the nitty gritty, but this, it was sort of this crescendoing roar. And it led to a town hall meeting at the annual meeting, which I was quite frankly lucky enough not to be present for because it was really highly contentious. It was essentially an hour of screaming from what I heard. And these are some of the comments that came out of it. I mean, these, these points are all very sort of sober and, and good points, but what was actually happening was, was a screaming match. So people said things like, think of all the good we do at routine checks. What about elderly people? And then there were concerns about operationalizing it. This is gonna be diff a difficult measure to operationalize. You won't be able to tell which routine checkup was indicated and which one wasn't. And again, these were not necessarily designed to be easy to operationalize because as Daniel, I think, described quite well, that wasn't really the goal of choosing wisely. So the way it sort of played out, the organization officially st stood by the list, although they, they kind of softened the language and tried to backtrack a little bit. But the list did stand, and the list that's currently you know, on the Choosing Wisely website is our original list and it contains the, the controversial item. But at the same time, the organization has assembled a new committee with all completely different members and they are revisiting the recommendations. And to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but that's what's happening. So the real reason I mention this, I mean, it's kind of a good story, but I think, it's a, I think it really sheds light on a lot of issues that are important here in Choosing Wisely. You know, the limitations of the format, the lists are brief. And as Daniel mentioned, there are sort of qualifying statements below the main statement. But still, this format doesn't lend itself to a whole lot of subtlety. And sometimes, for, in some clinical scenarios, that's what's needed. And so it's a challenge. I mean, I think you're always balancing the importance of trying to make clear statements with acknowledging all of the subtlety that's involved in a lot of these issues. It also points out the difficulty of reaching consensus among physicians. So, these are physician organizations. There has to be some degree of consensus, and I think the, the amount of consensus that different organizations have reached is probably different, but physicians tend to be independent folks with very strong opinions. So, so it's a challenge when you have organizations making these recommendations. There's a wide-held fear that these recommendations may impact coverage decisions, and I think the Choosing Wisely itself has gone out of its way to try to not have that happen but already that's come up in the Q&A kind of indirectly. And I think there's a real fear on the part of physicians that that has sometimes contributed to the sense that some of this is low hanging fruit because people, people don't want to go out on a limb to things for things that if you lose the subtlety may you know, prevent people from getting needed services covered. So I think that's actually my last slide. But that's really what I wanted to close with, and you know, I'd be happy to take any questions. No, thank you for your perspective here. And we do have um, a couple questions. One, I'm not sure if I should direct it to you or to others, but um, it's the last question that we had here. Are there indicators in order to identify the impact of choosing wisely on changing behavior of patients and physicians? So that's a, that's a great question, and people have been, I would say, actively working on that. Um, a lot of people have been trying to look for ways to sort of use claims data to try to track some of these things. Mm -hmm. it, it can be very challenging because a lot of them, again, can be subtle, and it's not always easy to get at this stuff through claims data. I mean, there are a couple of studies that I know kind of off the top of my head. There was one by Alan Rosenberg in, that was in JAMA Internal Medicine that right, looked in right data from Anthem and found they looked at I think seven or nine different choosing wisely recommendations that could be evaluated using claims data and found a couple of them there had been decline in the in sort of the overuse and in the rest there had not been. So people are trying yeah, to do this and 
I'd love to comment on that study if I could. Sure. Yeah, go ahead and finish, Deborah, and then you could jump in, Daniel. Sure. And there's also there was also a study um, that Carrie Colla did that looked in that looked across the country using claims data from Medicare at the rate of use of some of the services that were targeted in choosing wisely, and found that there's variation around the country, not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. So, so I would say you know people people are starting to find ways to use claims data to evaluate at least some of them, and I think some of them are easy to do that way, but most of them are difficult, and there's not really, um, there's not really an accepted way to do it yet. Okay. Daniel, you wanted to comment? Yeah, I, I think that um, uh, it's a misconception, uh, and I think it's a misconception of the implementation of clinical guidelines, that once you promulgate recommendations, or clinical guidelines that they'll be adopted and implemented. Um, education is the lowest level of quality improvement and behavioral change. Uh, time and time again, people uh, come out and talk about the need for more than just education. It takes uh, data and feedback. It takes system changes. Um, many people are working on behavioral health. Um, I wrote a letter uh, to the editor that will be in uh, JAMA in April saying that, in fact, why would you suspect that anything else that Anthem did, which they did nothing, actually, they didn't inform physicians, they didn't inform patients, they had no clinical intervention, which is hard for any kind of insurance company to have, mm -hmm. and yet they came out and said, listen, and maybe they didn't say it, but many people said, listen, choosing wisely doesn't work. And it's just you know, a poor evaluation of a campaign that did not set out to have behavioral change. It set out to have conversations and attitudinal changes and to really get it in. You know, when I, I get notices from Google Alert every day about mm -hmm. clinical articles that are addressing choosing wisely, that's exactly what you want. Behavioral change is very complex, and to think that we could promulgate recommendations and instantly they would change habits and change systems is preposterous. Um, it just doesn't happen, and it's a wrong expectation of the Choosing Wisely campaign to think that we could, by just simply putting out recommendations, it would you know, miraculously change um, behavior. It just doesn't happen that way. And in fact, in the JAM Internal Medicine, uh, there was a good article accompanying it that nobody does refer to that said just that. You just cannot have education by itself uh, to make behavioral change. I'd say you're in good yeah. company, you know, being on this webinar. This is Tom because, you know, guideline developers, uh, many of us that are on this call, we, we are um, – plagued by the same issue because it, it takes a while for something to be implemented into practice. Just publishing it, just stating it is not going to be enough. There needs to be a more concerted effort beyond just awareness and education. It's necessary, but that's totally sufficient. Sure. Go ahead, Deborah. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say I completely agree. I don't think it's necessarily fair. I, I think it's completely unrealistic to expect that just putting out these recommendations was going to change rates of these things happening and, and it really was never meant to, you know, but um, mm -hmm. I, I think one of the challenges is that people are expecting that and it's been so, it's almost a victim of its own success, the Choosing Wisely campaign. And I think, you know, we have to be very careful in being mindful of what it can and can't accomplish and how it's a tool, but not a, not really a robust intervention in and of itself. I think what it's done more than anything, Tom, is given people cover to make the changes mm -hmm. that they needed. It's been an enabler to begin the implementation process before choosing wisely and other efforts, and it's not us. People stood, you know, they didn't want to talk about overuse because as soon as they did, people would say you're rationing mm -hmm. or, you're not, or you're sacrificing quality. And in fact, we turned it around and said, by getting rid of waste, you are in fact improving quality. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you where we've had the most success, I think, in direct change is at the medical school and um, residency level. Um, ACP has had, uh, and in fact, Karen was involved, uh, Deborah was involved in that, of 
uh, doing curriculum, but there's there's been a lot of effort on our part as well to to really come up with um, uh, programs and the youth and this is, I think this has become a youth movement um, they have taken it up in extraordinary ways, very creative uh, ways of thinking about um, uh, uh, teaching better clinical decision making by uh, using the choosing wisely recommendations. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask Dom if he had um, a comment on that, but know that he had to drop off for a personal family matter. So I wanted to ask another question that's come in through the chat. Um, you know, is is choosing wisely going to go international? In uh, it already has. Um, okay, tell me about that. Um, I'm uh, attending uh, tomorrow a uh, Choosing Wisely national meeting in Canada, mm -hmm. and uh, next month in uh, Rome, uh, 15 countries uh, will be coming together to talk about their efforts in Choosing Wisely. There is a Choosing Wisely Netherlands, there is a Choosing Wisely Australia, there is a Choosing Wisely in the UK. It has hit 13 countries. And I think, you know, when I think back about why I think it spread, um, it's really given the clinicians an important voice and empowerment and engagement that really attracts um, a lot of people internationally, uh, particularly um, in countries that have a, a dominance of single payers, not to put down single payers, but I think that in single payer systems, sometimes physicians do not feel empowered. And I think this uh, notion of choosing wisely uh, has taken off because of that. Um, and it, it, it gives, I think, a platform uh, that is flexible. Um, yes, it's physician-led and consumer-partnered. Uh, but within that, uh, within those principles, there's latitude for lots of creativity and adoption on a local level. Um, so it's, it's been miraculous. I, I can say that um, we've had nothing to do with it. It is spread by itself. Um, uh, Choosing Wisely Canada was started by a person on our board, Wendy Levinson, um, uh, that, uh, and she is spearheading these conferences, and they've agreed to the principles. Um, there was a good paper uh, written by Wendy and, and myself on the principles of, of what Choosing Wisely was, but we have given our name uh, generously uh, across the country. I just got an uh, email from New Zealand wanting to use Choosing Wisely. Choosing Wisely is a good name and it's a good brand. Um, mm -hmm. And we've seen the power of the brand and people, you know, are, are becoming the lexicon, are you choosing wisely? And that's, mm -hmm. that's very powerful for, for thinking about mindset change. Do you happen to know if Consumer Reports is going to be involved in that effort? Um, time will tell. They're, they're, they're not an international uh, organization. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been hard for some, you know, we're very lucky with Consumer Reports. It's, it was really, um, I think, a, a very smart thing to have gone with Consumer Reports. But there are consumer partners. There's one in Canada. Uh, don't ask me what it is. I think it's called Consumers. And uh, so people are trying to get a consumer partner because it is, it is a powerful force. Um, you know, a lot of physicians um, feel, and I don't know if it's true or not, that a lot of the demand comes from patients. Um, so I think at least neutralizing that uh, notion with uh, a campaign that's focused on patients uh, is, is really important. Um, so it's been a great partnership, and as you say, they've made investments without uh, financial return. Wonderful. Looks like you might be putting on some miles visiting and representing the ABIM Foundation and choosing wisely. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted to uh, mention, uh, since you're on the phone, Tom, that neurology, one of the questions was that people co-endorsed recommendations. And neurology, uh, American Academy of Neurology, actually looked at all the recommendations and came up with 70 that they thought were applicable to uh, neurologists and did a nice paper on that. They did a nice analysis of that. And I thought that was a very creative way. Uh, nephrology looked at all the recommendations and came out with a list of five that they thought 
were, were relevant to um, uh, nephrologists. So some of that kind of uh, joint uh, development, uh, joint uh, endorsement has happened. Uh, the pulmonologists and critical care people and the critical care nurses came up with one set of recommendations. I had to do with the campaign over, and we were a little bit more advanced. I would say that we do recommendations by teams um, of physicians and societies that are working on a particular uh, disease or uh, condition. Um, but we started this way, and now we're having non-physicians join the campaign. So, Daniel, do you imagine that there are specialty societies that are not participating in? If you know of any, please, please. If you know of any, please tell me. And I was going to say, do you think they might not be participating because their recommenda- the recommendations they may make have already been covered by another society? Well, I, I, so I don't know if there are any. Um, I'd love to get the more non-physician groups in, frankly, at this point. Mm-hmm. And um, it's okay if there's overlap. We don't like disagreements, but overlap is okay. We have had a little bit of, of, of debate uh, for instance, on PSA tests. And mm-hmm. we try to um, uh, um, uh, accommodate that. Sorry. Um, sure. But um, we, we try to um, uh, accommodate that. PSA testing is uh, uh, for uh, uh, the family physicians, say, no PSA testing, uh, no shared decision making, and neurologists say no PSA t- testing, but shared decision making. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, Deborah, I wonder if you want to comment any more on the the town hall or the resolution of, you know, your reconciling the process that SGIM employed in that outcry and the backlash from your members, I don't think that, and, and I think you said this too, that SGIM, this, this example, it's not an isolated incident. So what recommendations would you have for other societies that are encountering, potentially encountering these types of challenges? I mean, you know, I, I honestly think it speaks to, an un, a, to a tension that underpins this whole enterprise, which is that de-implementation is difficult a lot of doctors feel if you start to push things to out of the low hang away from low hanging fruit you're then making recommendations that people are going to disagree about and you know doctors i think get nervous about statements not to do stuff because like i said they they worry that there'll be coverage decisions even if they agree fundamentally which in this case they did not <laughs> i still think people are very nervous so you know i don't i don't know what the lesson is i you know, we were very proud of our recommendations, to be honest. The committee, we really thought like they were robust and well thought out and they were, there was evidence to support all of them, which, which is not always the case. I mean, because for a lot of these kinds of things, there just is not good evidence. And if you read what we actually wrote, it, we didn't say people should never go to the doctor. We said if somebody mm-hmm. feels completely fine and has no chronic medical conditions, they don't necessarily need to come every year. There's nothing magical about the calendar year. But I think the problem that this controversy uncovered is that most people who are looking at the recommendation aren't going to read that whole paragraph that we wrote that clarifies it. That's what I wanted to ask. You know, there might be, is there a misinterpretation with, you know, that the the rubric in with, with which choosing wisely operates, you know, a 15, not characters, but a 15 uh, word statement followed by a, a brief rationale and a full rationale are are people missing, you know, all that underlying text and supporting evidence? I think they probably are, to be honest. I mean, I think the best choosing wisely recommendations, or at least the easiest to implement and the least controversial, are ones that are based on guideline recommendations that are very robust and, you know, that come from a true guideline and Mm -hmm. are supported by evidence. And you can be very specific about the population you're talking about. You know, don't do this in this specific population. But there's always there's a balance between the specificity and the generalizability and applicability, because mm-hmm. you know medicine is just not that straightforward a lot of the time, and there are very few things where you can say, you know, never do this. It's o- it's always sort of don't do it in most people or don't do it unless there's X Y Z going on. 
and and it's challenging. I mean, I don't really, I don't have an answer to how to reconcile it. And I think, but I, I think the, the problem of the loss of nuance is a very real problem with this kind of thing. And that wasn't the entirety of the, of what happened in SGIM, but it was part of it. And, and I think there were plenty of people whose concern was really related to that. And, and I think that's a, I think it's a very valid concern, particularly as, Again, the, the success of choosing wisely makes it difficult because people cite the sort of one sentence recommendation mm-hmm. and without they even the define it without the context. And and again, maybe looking in claims data to see how often it's happening. And in claims data, you're not getting any of the clinical nuance that has, or that's not true. You're not, you're probably not getting most of the clinical nuance that plays into these kinds of clinical decisions. Hmm. So I don't think I answered your question, but it's a good question. <laughs> Sure. I wanted to comment on Please. Uh, what Deborah just said. You know, um, we have been very clear that these recommendations are not absolutes. And uh, we have put in uh, what the evidence is and what um, are the exceptions and what are the red flags. So, um, you know, you're, you do a balancing act. Um, clinical guidelines are very complex to read. Uh, these are easier and accessible, and there's a trade-off between the two of so comprehensive that somebody's not going to really act on it um, as, you know, as it, it's a balancing act. Um, so I also disagree with Deborah, and I, she's a dear colleague, um, that uh, SGIM was the only one that had a recommendation that hit the pocketbook. I, I don't believe that's true. Um, People, uh, you know, if you don't do uh, proton beam therapy for, uh, uh, you know, you're going to lose income and physicians lose income because they, they read those. So uh, there's, there's many that, and there's many that, that have downstream, you know, losses of income um, as well. You know, you, you have less incidentals that have to be probed, and that causes reduction of, of income. So I, I think... When we look at that notion of just the test, the, the, the downstream costs uh, or, or lack of income, um, and that wasn't our goal. Our goal was to have conversations. We're not trying to affect or, or you know, uh, physicians' income. That wasn't our, our, our goal was to improve quality. And if they, if they did or didn't uh, affect physicians' income was not our criteria. Okay. Well, I know we have just a few minutes left. I wanted to give each of you an opportunity for any type of closing statements or parting thoughts before we conclude the webinar. So, uh, Daniel, let me start with you. I'm I'm trying to find questions that I thought were uh, you know good to answer. Um, um, you know, I think that uh, this uh, it took us you know 40 years to have overuse, and we built it up with technology. And um, we've just started. This campaign is, is uh, you know, going on its fourth year. And we've made a lot of strides, and we need to do a lot more. Uh, we're trying to fan some flames around implementation. We're trying to fan some flames about uh, research and trying to uh, really understand better implementation and interventions for de-employing something. We don't know how to de-employ things. We know how to start things but we don't know very much about the science of starting it. So I think we're on a long journey, but thank God we're on the journey and we have a concerted effort and physicians are, are pretty engaged. And I think, you know, we see when, when quality improvement doesn't involve physicians, we have workarounds, we have resistance and barriers. I think we've gotten physicians on board, clinicians on board with this whole thing. So I think there's a better chance of, of implementation that's going to work and not alienate clinicians in their, in their daily lives and make uh, mm-hmm. practice miserable uh, and rather uh, bring joy to practice when they feel like they're doing the right thing for their patients. Great. Deborah, any closing comments? Um, I, I, I agree with that. As, as somebody who's done research and overuse and been involved with this, I think choosing wisely has been incredibly successful at sort of raising the stature of the issue of unnecessary care. And it really has created a national conversation. People really, when I give talks, I ask people if they've heard of it and they often have. 
It's also, you know, really served as a focal point for studies of overuse, which I think has helped the overuse literature, which again, I think helps the concept of not doing unnecessary things, because we certainly need better literature to inform a lot of, a lot of these kinds of efforts. And you mentioned earlier, or somebody mentioned that a lot of guidelines don't have, do not do kind of recommendations, but only do recommendations. And when I said, somebody wrote, asked a question about this, when I said that the best, you know, a lot of the good choosing wisely recommendations, or the, in the best case, they come from a guideline, it's only in the case where the guideline actually has done that work of having recommendations not to do stuff. And there are some, certainly some guidelines that have done that. And my hope is that one of the things that will come out of, of choosing wisely in the longer term, like Daniel was alluding to, is you know a better evidence base to inform recommendations like that in guidelines, which will then help people make recommendations like that in guidelines, and help and help people implement them in ways that are you know very detailed and clinically nuanced. I would hope that that happens in surgical specialties. Um, that 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 is an area that's ripe for uh, clinical guidelines. Great. Well, thank you both. If uh, the if the audience was not on mute, you'd likely hear applause, cheering, and and many thanks from them. But since they are on mute, I will I'll do that on their behalf. And thank you both for um, your your participation and the time that you spent preparing for this presentation and being on this uh, webinar today. And thanks to our audience for participating on. Uh, thank you for participating uh, on this uh, webinar. Uh, as I've got here on my second to last slide, uh, within a week this webinar recording will be packaged and posted to the Guidelines International Network site where the other webinars are housed. I'll also be giving the file to uh, Consumer Reports to the ABIM Foundation and then to Dr. Korenstein uh, for them to disseminate as they wish. Uh, please look for email announcements from uh, Sandy Lewis, our Chair of the Guidelines International Network, for upcoming webinar announcements and business of the Guidelines International Network North American community. And if you haven't done so already, please register if you're able for the International Conference in Philadelphia. So with that, I will conclude our webinar and thank everyone for their participation. Thank you. Thank you.